Let me invite your attention to the little letter of Jude. We began this back the 1st of May, and we will be continuing through the summer looking at the book of Jude under the banner of fighting for the faith. Pick up with me, if you would, in verse 3. Our focus is going to be primarily on verse 5 this morning. I know your notes say verses 5, 6, and 7, uh, but we are really only going to look at one of these three illustrations that Jude is giving us. Uh, t- t- this week, and then we'll come back and, and pick up the next time uh, in verse 6. Under the heading of the unavoidable rhyme of history, and I'm going to explain that as I get started uh, this morning. Verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he's kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality, and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Father, we thank you today for this Lord's Day and this opportunity to gather, to worship, to sing, to pray, to praise, and Father, to be discipled in the Word. Lord, I pray that you would attune our hearts to the message of this passage this morning. That, Father, we would recognize that there is a certainty to judgment for those who reject your word. And, Father, we are looking in a context of a people who would profess to be the people of God, but have allowed themselves to be misled and taken astray by what Jude calls ungodly people who have crept in and they are under judgment. Lord, help us to draw the parallels to where we are today and see that it really does matter what you believe and it really does matter how you live in light of what you believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a, a concept in history, I think perhaps it's more of a philosophical concept called historical recurrence. Are you familiar with the phrase historical recurrence? Recurrence. Historical recurrence, in essence, says that history tends to repeat itself. Uh, You may be familiar with that phrase. Indeed, history is repeating itself. In more recent times, and by more recent times, I mean in modern times, that statement was put together or expressed for one of the first times in the culture by George Eliot in which the statement was made, history we know is apt to repeat itself. Yogi Berra, the great American philosopher Yogi Berra, gave us a different twist on that when he said, it's like deja vu all over again. Deja vu is historical recurrence on a personal level. Does history repeat itself? Well, my friends, if it does, it truly does. It would suggest a cyclical reality to history. And I'm sorry, I have a problem with that. Because a cyclical worldview suggests a lot of things that you don't want to get into. The biblical concept of history is not one that is cyclical, but one that is linear. We are moving to an end point, to an ultimate telos, to an ultimate purpose or end. 
and that ultimate purpose or end is the establishment of the eternal kingdom in this world with the King of kings and Lord of lords reigning over his people. That's where we're headed. So no, I don't completely buy the idea. In fact, I don't buy the idea of historical recurrence. Pastor, are you saying history doesn't repeat itself? Well, no, we just need to understand it properly. We need to understand that the phrase is really an expression of a theological concept. And that is this. It's not that history repeats itself. It's that you reap what you sow. And the problem is you tend to keep sowing the same wrong seed and expecting a different outcome. And the reality is you just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. That's really more in line with what historical uh, recurrence is about. It's not that history repeats itself as much as we keep doing the same things to bring about the same consequences. I like the way Mark Twain puts it. He modified this, or it's purported that he modified this. Uh, I have not been able to find, and I looked at some researchers in Twain, and they have not been able to find the source of this, but it certainly sounds like it. This is what I would call Twainian style. What Twain said was, it, or is purported to have said, is that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes a lot. Don't you love that? It's not that history repeats itself, it just rhymes. Now, we do know that he actually did say this. And I put this in your notes because this shows a tremendous theological insight into the nature of fallen man. Twain is sometimes accused of being an atheist or an agnostic. It's not that. Twain was so disappointed in the way purported Christians act that he had a hard time believing that Jesus ever made a difference in their life. We can relate to that, can't we? What Twain did say is this. It is not worthwhile to try to keep history from repeating itself, for man's character will always make the preventing of the repetitions impossible. You'll have to meditate on that. What he's basically alluding to is the fallen nature of man, again, causes us to plant the same sinful seeds and sow the same or reap the same sinful consequences. And as a result, we can expect real consequences to come. And the ultimate consequence is the judgment of God. Now, there's no doubt that patterns and repetitions can be observed in history. There's no doubt that actions have consequences, and the same repeated actions do tend to bear the same repeated fruit. But that doesn't mean there is not purpose in historical events. There most certainly are. In fact, I would suggest to you that this cycle suggests a hidden force guiding historical events. It suggests that there is a judge who indeed judges. Not a coincidence, providence. See, God not only makes himself known through the created order, but he makes himself known through his providence, his work in the created order. And his providence includes what at times may seem to be historical recurrence, but in actuality, what we are seeing are the consequences of a sovereign judge. We are looking at the letter of Jude. You may be wondering what all this has to do with Jude. This is what it has to do with it. We are looking at this letter under the banner of fighting for the faith. Jude says, I felt it absolutely necessary. I was wanting to write to you about the common salvation we share. But in light of what you are experiencing and in light of what the faith is experiencing, I found it necessary to appeal to you to actually contend earnestly for the faith once for all handed down to the saints. He's exhorting his audience and he's exhorting us today in 21st century America. That the church is worth standing for, it's worth fighting for, the gospel is worth agonizing over. And the language that he uses here, particularly the verbal structures that he uses here, is suggesting that this fight is ongoing and it's never going to end. That the fight is continual. There is an ongoing struggle. And if you don't contend earnestly for the faith, you won't have a faith to contend for. That's how important it is. Keep on fighting for the unchanging truth. Boy, I don't know that there is a more important message for the church in America today than that. To stand and fight for the truth. So the task 
Jude sets before us here is an important task. It's a critical task. It's not an unprecedented task he's putting before us. It's actually the ongoing task that has been ours since creation began. It began in the Garden of Eden with the question that was posed that was really the first assault on the Word of God, and that is the question Satan asked of Eve. Did God really say that? It extends all the way through the development of the Old Testament people. Israel continues in the wilderness temptations of Jesus. And here we come with the birth of the church, and the fight is still on. And it will continue until the time that we know as this time comes to an end. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's when the fight ends. You got it? That's when the fight ends. So until then, strap it on and stand and fight for the faith. We are involved in the truth war. So we have this issue and an urgent appeal issued by Jude. We've explored that for the past month. Jude has explained to us the ultimate concern in this fight. That what we are seeing is the perverting of the grace of God. Ungodly people. Imposters, if you would, have infiltrated the church. And that's the stunning thing about this. Is that the church itself has been infiltrated by those who are misleading, if possible, even the elect. You do understand that, that today it is hard to know who's teaching you and preaching you the truth and who's telling you what you want to hear. Because let's be honest, we want to hear what we want to hear. The truth is painful sometimes. But the truth we must defend and contend for. We cannot pervert the grace of God. Ungodly persons were turning the grace of our God into licentiousness. Jude's Context, if you'll recall from last week, has an explicit sexual nature to it. That should not surprise us. That seems to be, we seem to be undergoing a rebirth of that, where sound doctrine is being twisted and allowing and promoting the perversion of grace. The reason for that is the abandoning of the authority of God. They have not only twisted truth and turned it into licentiousness, into perversion, they do so because they deny the authority of Christ. They deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. My friends, listen to me. When you disregard the authority of Christ in your life, when you disregard the authority of God's Word in your life, when you dismiss it, you will eventually discard it. And when you do, you will become a law unto yourself, And history will repeat itself in that God's judgment will come. That's what I want us to focus on. The repeating of history in the form of the judgment of God. Look at verse 4. There is a statement in verse 4. The phrase in verse 4 that we cannot pass over lightly. In it, Jude, in describing these ungodly ones, those who actually have infiltrated the church and are leading people astray, Jude says of them that they were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. That is a, an historical reference. Jude is saying that in the presence of these false teachers, the ones who have infiltrated the people of God, the ones who are perverting the truth, the ones who are bringing the consequence of misleading and disregarding the truth of God's word and deceiving the people with a false gospel are about to experience the consequences, certain consequences that we can look back in history and see that God has consistently judged this type of thing. Written long before, is a condemnation attached to the judgment of God that we see in Scripture. Jude is essentially saying, let me show you what I mean. And then he proceeds to do that. That's what we're seeing in verses 5, 6, and 7. He's going to point to three warnings from times past 
showing that rebellion against God, rebellion against the standard of God, rejection of the standard of God, which leads to the perversion of truth, always, always brings the judgment of God. This is where we're about to see, or we're on the verge of seeing, I believe we're watching it unfold before our very eyes. We are watching historical recurrence in the sense that we are about to see the rhyme of history, and it cannot be avoided. It is almost here. Three cases, and I'm only going to look at the first one. I, want, I started to look at all three of them together, but you know the story. You've heard me say this before. Well, I wanted to do all of it, but you know what? I don't want to take till supper time tonight, so we'll just do one. Because each one of these is important. I mean, they are critical to understanding the argument and hopefully seeing the peril we are facing today. This is not just a history lesson. I know the vast majority of you do not like history. You've told me, I don't like history. Well, that's because you don't understand history. History is not places and dates and names that you have to memorize to pass a test. History is ideas and their consequences played out in time. And as the Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana put it, those who cannot remember history are doomed to repeat it. Again, an expression of historical recurrence or the rhyme of history. So let's look at this first one. Jude's first case study, and that is the Exodus. So in verse 4, he tells us these individuals were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. The this condemnation is a reference to the judgment of God. Now I want to remind you, verse 5, though you know everything once and for all, I'm going to tell you something you already know. Here's our problem. Many of you are very familiar with the story of the Exodus. Those of you who have been with me on Wednesday nights for a solid year now, have been working through the life and leadership of Moses, and we have been in the book of Exodus for nearly a year. You know the story, but over the past year, you've had some aha moments, haven't you? We've actually gotten into some depth to, to show you there's more to this than meets the eye. Listen, if you're dependent on Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments on TV to give you the story of the Exodus, you're going to come up woefully short on what you're supposed to be seeing. Listen, I love that movie. I've seen it at least 40 times. I love to watch it every year. I got to watch it this year in New Orleans on a Saturday night. Right off of Bourbon Street, I was partying hard, kicked back in a hotel room watching Moses. Am I a party animal or what? You know this, but pay attention. Now, I want to remind you, though you know everything once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Man, talk about a punch in the mouth. He saved a people and then ultimately destroyed them. Did he just say a saved people lost their salvation? That's an interesting twist, isn't it? Now, that's not what he's saying. So follow along here. This is an example of history repeating itself, so to speak. This is a, an example of the rhyme of history, specifically the judgment of God in history. So Jude begins with remi this reminder uh, that we, we don't really need to be reminded of this because we know this. However, we do need to be reminded of it because we need to be refreshed as to the significance of this. Jude points first off to the Exodus. Understand the significance of the Exodus. The Exodus of Israel from Egypt is the defining historical event that gave Israel the identity as the people of God. You got that? That's how significant it is. From Exodus Forward, from the book of Exodus forward, Israel will be consistently identified 
as the people that God brought out of Egypt. It's the, de, it's the hallmark defining point of the people of God. They are the ones God delivered from Egypt. So the exodus becomes defining. The Lord saves this people out of Egypt. But then Jude drops this bomb. The same people he saved, ultimately, he destroyed. Remember those people who came out, who identified with Israel, who identified as Israel. Listen, they came out, but they did not go in. They, they came out. They were delivered from slavery, but they never actually made it to the promise. And the question you have to ask is why? And what you're going to find out is they did precisely what Jude told us here about these imposters in his day. They perverted the truth of God's word. They perverted the grace of God because they rejected the authority of God. They did not believe. And because they did not believe, they wound up twisting the standard of God to their own destruction. Like I said, we've been working through the life of Moses on Wednesday nights. And we've learned just how important that story is. But listen, it's, it's a story that's important not just to Israel and their identity. It is a story that's important to our identity and our understanding of who we are as the church. Now, you may be thinking, how, how in the world is that? How in the world is an Old Testament story important to our understanding of salvation? For the very simple reason, that is our salvation. We're being painted a picture of our own deliverance. We weren't delivered from the slavery of Egypt. We were delivered from the slavery of sin. We were brought out not by the blood of a lamb. We were brought out by the blood of the lamb. The parallels are simply stunning. And that's because God is using history to help us understand who we are as the people of God. It's such an important event that Moses will tell Israel over and over again from the time before it happened till after it happened that they had better not forget this. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 3, Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you departed from Egypt, from the house of slavery. For by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out from this place. Remember this day. Don't you dare forget it. Remember that a powerful hand, the powerful hand of God, had to bring you out, otherwise you would have never come out. I got news for you today. Don't you ever forget the cross. Don't you ever forget the day you were set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. It took a powerful hand to save you from your sin. In fact, had it not been for the hand of God, you would have never come out of your sin. You didn't do that. He did that. Israel didn't set themselves free, and neither did you. It took the blood of Jesus to do that. So don't you forget. Remember this day. So the Exodus event becomes an important event for the Christian as well. And here's why. Because the Exodus is paradigmatic for Christians. It's the picture, it's the paradigm of how salvation works, how God saves His people. And Jude actually makes that connection here by invoking the exodus. Jude is telling us that the Lord who brought Israel out is the same master and Lord being denied by these infiltrators. And you do notice he identifies the master and Lord not as God, but as Jesus. Does that mean Jesus set Egypt free from the exodus? Yeah. I don't understand all that. I don't either, but I believe it. Well, actually, it's not that difficult to understand if you understand that Jesus is the eternal God, second person of the Trinity, and he's always been there. He's always been there. He's here now. He is the one who sets us free. Only Jesus can bring us out. He is our master and Lord. Sadly, tragically, Many in Israel were going to prove themselves to be illegitimate. They were going to prove themselves to be imposters. As Moses ascends Mount Sinai, 
He will spend 40 days in the presence of God receiving the standard of God, receiving the laws of God, receiving the Ten Commandments, and then some. And as you read the story, you read that narrative in Exodus chapter 32. We haven't gotten that pla- to that place on Wednesday night, so uh, in fact, we'll be in Exodus 19 when we get together again, not this Wednesday night because of Vacation Bible School, but the next Wednesday night. So those of you who are just kind of lounging around on Wednesday night, watching things you don't really need to watch because it doesn't benefit you at, at all, come and let's study uh, Moses together on Wednesday night. You can, you can do it. I don't hear any amen. Hey, just an offer. I'll, I'll, I'll deliver if you'll come. No charge. Okay. As you read Exodus chapter 32, you, you begin to see what these people really are. Listen beginning in verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountains, the people assembled about Aaron and they said to Aaron, Come, make us a God who will go before us. Listen to this. For this Moses dude, this man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. You hear that? They have seen God work through Moses in ways that are astounding. Moses is gone for a few days and they're going, Moses? Moses who? We don't, listen. He may have brought us out, but look where we are now. We need somebody else to finish the job. You can't depend on Moses. This Moses dude. How incredibly forgetful the so-called people of God can be. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, when Aaron saw this, was he appalled? Did he begin to, re- to, to preach and proclaim objecting to the, idol- the blatant idolatry? Is that what he did? No. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And here's how we're going to separate it. The ne- uh, celebrate it. The next day they rose early and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and to drink. Sounds like Baptists, right? Go to church, sit down, eat and drink. Ah, and then they rose up to play. Two things stand out here in this story. This is what Jude is alluding to. It's part of what Jude is alluding to. This happens in a context of worship. This blatant rejection of God and the worship of a golden image, an idol, happens in a context of worship. They're at the foot of Mount Sinai. That is the place where Moses originally met with God. It was the place where God chose to reveal himself to Moses on behalf of the people of God. So they are actually at the foot of Mount Sinai in the presence of God. You can't help but believe that as Moses is meeting with God on the mount, they are aware of something going on above them. I mean, when God shows up, you know it. And as that is happening, they are persuading Aaron to fashion a God for them. A God more in line with the cultural gods that had shaped them. In other words, they were wanting to worship like the culture that they had been a part of. Sound familiar? They were taking their cues for how to worship God from a culture that didn't even know God. We've got the same thing going on today. So it's a context of worship. They, like all people's sense are a religious people who tend to worship a God they create in their own image. What Aaron, and remember, Aaron has spent a considerable amount of time with his brother. 
much of Aaron's understanding of God has been shaped by his brother Moses. And as they have spent time together over the past months, you know Moses has shared with Aaron his experiences in Egypt. And at the same time, his experiences with God. And Aaron has taken and he's kind of created a pluralistic culture within Israel. By the way, that's the culture we live in today. We live in a cultural a culture of pluralism. Pluralism essentially says there are multiple ways to God. They're all equally valid. How dare you condemn somebody else's way of seeking God? Failure to embrace a pluralistic understanding of worship in God brands you as a bigot or worse. Welcome to the air that we breathe. Here's my point. Aaron knows the truth. But Aaron, influenced by the bogus believers that are surrounding him, rejects the authority of God and perverts the grace of God. That's exactly what's happening here. He will ultimately reject the authority of God, and as a result, he will pervert the grace of God. And it will demonstrate itself in what happens. Exodus 32, verse 6, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Their worship turns to indulgence, which turns to revelry, which turns to debauchery. The word for rise up and play used here has very strong sexual overtures. It is a word that comes out of the cult of prostitution associated with the false gods of not only Egypt, but most of the culture of that day. Why is it that sexual perversion is an inherent part of false worship? Well, all we have to do is go back to Eden, and we'll see that. Moses doesn't give us the details here. He just makes the reference to it. He doesn't need to. As you see this word occur further in the story, particularly in Numbers chapter 25, you will see Israel's development include not only idolatry, but immorality. And God's response to that is this. Exodus 32, verses 9 and 10. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, and my anger will burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. God's anger is kindled, and is his intent to, to destroy them. Now, you may say, Pastor, but, you know, Moses interceded, and God settled down. And he didn't destroy them. Is that the truth? Oh, no, he's eventually going to destroy them anyway because they are never going to repent and learn. They are going to prove themselves illegitimate to the very end. But this is an example of God's grace being upheld because of the intercession of Moses. Does that give us anything practical to grab a hold of? Absolutely. Do you know what God's people ought to be doing today more than anything? Is interceding for what's going on in the culture and infiltrating the church. We need to pray for the culture we're a part of. We need to do like the counsel that Jeremiah was given in Babylon. You need to go in uh, and you, you need to buy houses, go to work, and pray for the benefit of the city. Be a force for good in the culture. We're not supposed to retreat from the culture and remain untainted from it. We're supposed to be salt and light in the culture. But what if the culture is in your church? Well, that's when you have to contend earnestly for the faith. Like I said, they prove themselves to be unbelievers. And judgment will follow. It's not just in this incident. It's going to be in their refusal to actually enter Canaan. As this story continues to unfold, in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, you can read about the spying of Canaan, the report coming back, everybody being in agreement. You know what? God is good. Man, do you see what he's giving us? God is good. However, we really don't think we can do that. Uh, that's going to be hard. We might actually 
have to get up in the morning and open the Bible and pray every now and then. We might actually have to do something besides show up at church when we feel like it to actually become the people of God to take the things He's promised to us. We, we may actually have to live like God's people and not like the culture. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. Moses, if it's all the same to you, we're just going to camp out back on the edge of God's promises and we're just going to kind of pray and hope He takes us out before it gets too bad. Where have I heard that before? Can I sadly tell you, I have been hearing that most of my life as a pastor. Hearing people say, you know what, we don't have to worry about the world because God's going to rapture us out anyway. Don't hold your breath. Because I'm going to tell you what, if I'm God and you be thankful I'm not. When I heard one of my people say, oh Lord, just get us out of here so we don't have to go through difficult times. I'm going to make sure you're at the end of the line and you stay to the end of the show. Because you're not supposed to be camped on the edge of the promises, holding your breath, praying you don't experience difficulty in this life. You're supposed to be engaged with the culture, knowing you're going to experience difficulty in this life. And that's okay. God has promised you the worst thing they can do is kill you and send you home. I'm ready to go home. How about you? They prove themselves to be unbelievers. And judgment follows. By the way, this is so important. It is so important that Jude is not the only one in the New Testament who references it. Paul will reference it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He tells the Corinthian church, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized in the Moses in the cloud and the sea. He's talking about the Exodus. They all drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. You know what he just said? He said, they proved themselves to be imposters, and God dropped them in the wilderness. The writer to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, also mentions this very same thing. Listen to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Take care, brothers, that we, excuse me, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you and in an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. Did you catch that? You prove yourselves to be a partaker of Christ if you actually hold on and live for him to the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Okay, what's he talking about, those who provoked him? He tells us, for who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So, we see, they were not able to enter because of unbelief. That is the writer of the book of Hebrews giving us his understanding of the meaning of And the reason for all the death associated with the people of God in the Exodus. The truth of the matter is they were God's people by identification, but not by transformation. Their name was on the church roll, but they never had experienced saving grace. They simply did not believe God. They did not hold to the truth of God. And as a result, they wound up perverting the grace of God. Here's the point I want you to see today. And what Jude wanted those people to understand. Identifying as a Christian, being part of the visible people of God, does not guarantee eternal security 
unless it is accompanied by a living personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, are you suggesting to me that I have to work to be saved? No, I am not suggesting that. What I am telling you is that Scripture clearly tells us it is in the living of the faith that you prove that you have the faith. An absence of a living faith in Christ is proof there is no faith in Christ. That's an important piece of the puzzle that helps us to understand what in the world is happening in this thing we call the church in America in the year 2021. Belief. Holding to the faith once for all to liver to the saints is verified by actually living that faith. You hold to the faith, not some perversion of the faith. You bear testimony to the saving reality of the work of Christ in your life. Which is what Jude is going to go on to say and why he's going to go on to say down in verse 21 of Jude. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Hold on and stir up that faith. My friends, listen, it's, it's one thing to be in the church crowd, in the religious crowd. There are so many in the crowd of the exodus. They came out with the people of God, but they didn't go in with the people of God. They weren't genuine. They were rebels. They would not submit to the rule of God in their life. They doubted His promises. And Scripture tells us both in Old and New Testaments that they actually died in unbelief. Now here's why that story is so important to Jude's argument. He is using this as the quintessential example of identifying as the people of God, but not being the people of God. And the proof is in what you do with what you say you believe. And if it leads to a rejection of the authority of God and produces a perversion of grace, you're proving that you're the same imposter as those who invaded the church Jude is addressing. In other words, history is going to repeat itself. Or, let me go with the Twainian version. It's going to rhyme with the past. You're going to see the connection. If you do not submit to the authority of the Word of God, if you twist and change the intent, if you pervert the grace of God, if you do not heed the warnings of God, if you do not trust the promises of God, the judgment of God will inevitably fall. It was written long ago. You will not avoid it. That's his first case study, the Exodus. And as wonderful and insightful as that is, it gets worse. The next time I'm going to show you his further case study and shock you with the story of fallen angels. Listen, I forget the dude who sings the country song about his girl being a fallen angel. Let me just remind everybody. I know I rode this hobby horse to death a, long, death a long time ago. You never have been an angel. You're not an angel now. And you're not going to get any wings. If you want wings, get a Red Bull. You weren't created to have wings. You're much better than that. You were created to know intimate fellowship with the one who created you. There are no wings involved in that. You don't need them. Grace takes you higher than you deserve to go. So, no, you're not an angel, and certainly your ex is not a fallen angel. But, oh, the story that Jude incorporates to help us understand the consequences of sin, the consequences of rejecting the authority of the Word of God. 
and the ultimate consequence will be the judgment of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We praise you for grace. Father, thank you for showing us the standard. Father, thank you for enabling us through your grace, through your spirit, Lord, to understand and to live and enjoy the grace we do not deserve. Father, help us to be a people of the word who understand that the standard of God is our authority. Not what we want it to say, but what it does say and teach. Lord, help us to hold tight lest we stray and eventually dismiss your standard for our own. Help us to know how to live in a culture that's done that very thing. Help us, as Jude challenges us, to contend earnestly for the truth, to contend earnestly for the faith, delivered for us and to us once and for all through the blood of Jesus Christ. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.